Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Leading Improvement webinar, The Skills That You Need. I am excited to be sharing with you some new thoughts I've got on the whole world of improvement and the, the types of, the varied types of skills and knowledge that improvement leaders need, whether you're full-time or you're someone who's a, a manager or a leader and you're wanting to lead improvement in your area, either one of those roles, and, and consultants as well, welcome to you as well. Any of you are, are needing, I think, a little bit of a broader look in what level of skills you need to be effective in your roles. So quick sound check, if you could, uh, some of you who are familiar with the GoToWebinar, if you could please raise your hand, let me know that you can hear me loud and clear. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna put everyone's hand down now. Now you know how to raise your hand during Q&A, right? So we can have maybe some verbal Q&As this time and uh, not all in the question area. Although you are certainly welcome to write questions at any time during the webinar in the question box and I'll get to them. In some cases, I'll get to them during the webinar. In many cases, I'll wait till the end. We're gonna go uh, till 12.15 Pacific time and I'd like to, with that note, welcome those of you where it is extremely late and extremely early. We've got quite a nice um, a spread across the globe of people that are on the webinar today. Welcome to all of you. And any of you that are on Twitter, I welcome you to tweet anything that you find that's um, meaningful to you and resonates with you throughout the broadcast. So let's dig, dig into it. Um, one of the things that many people aren't aware of is that we do a lot of work in organizations where there are full-time improvement professionals already in place. Uh, for those organizations that don't have full-time improvement professionals, what we do is we go in and lead improvement with the kind of guidance that they're going to be developing some internal resources and we're looking to see who those resources are that are resonating with improvement and have a um, an interest in moving into those roles and that type of thing. But most of our clients do have at least one full-time professional and some people have very, very large groups of professionals. So the bulk of today's webinar is going to be geared primarily to those that are internal, but those of you that are consultants, you know, this, this type of thinking applies no matter where you are in an organization and whether you're external or internal. For those of you who may not be subscribers, we do have a, a pretty meaty M-E-A-T-Y, newsletter every month. It's not a marketing newsletter, it's, it's content heavy. And that's also the best place to find out about new webinars and the other free resources we give. It does give you access to our templates and checklists and assessments as well. So I hope that you'll take up on that. Uh, none of it costs anything, it's all free. So as far as our focus today, there were three main objectives I had. One is to help deepen everyone's understanding about what lean actually is. So you may wonder, well, why is this you know, suddenly all about lean? Well, I don't know any organization that is serious about improvement that isn't using at least some of the elements of lean to achieve whatever business performance improvement they're looking for. And lean is one of the most misunderstood types of improvement methodology. So I think it's important for all of us to understand what lean really is so that we can be more effective in helping organizations deploy it. Uh, also, I wanted to make sure that we talk about what the current level of proficiency you may have is and be able to get better at recognizing your blind spots. And then once you recognize those blind spots, be able to provide the means to develop some sort of a development plan so you can improve on those fronts. Now. A little history, I think, on what has caused me to develop this this webinar at this particular time. First thing is, you know, when I work with organizations with internal dedicated improvement professionals or leaders that are spending a piece of their time in improvement, most of the time I find that they're, you know, pretty early on in their development, and yet the organization has this false sense of proficiency around those people, and one of two things happens. Either the, the people in these roles are placed in untenable positions where they're being expected to perform at mastery levels, but they simply don't have the experience yet to be at that level, or even worse is that they get into positions where they don't know what they don't know, and they're actually harming the improvement process and the improvement 
journey, and I do see that a fair amount. So those are the two different areas where I really would like to um, you know, focus on that. The other thing that happened recently was in July, I spoke at the coaching summit, the Lean Coaching Summit in Long Beach, California. I gave a full day workshop, and then I also had two kind of extended sessions. In all three sessions, we did a coaching exercise where we broke into groups of three, and each person played all three of the roles, one at a time. A coach, a problem owner, and a second coach, so that's the coach of the coach. I had 140 people go through the workshop and those two extended sessions. Out of the 140, every single one of them brought a problem to the table that we worked on when they were the problem owner. And out of that 140, only three of them clearly identified the problem on the first round. There were, I would say, 60 to 70 percent of the people in the room never got a clear problem statement by the end of the session. So all of these folks were in the sessions to learn how to be coaches, and yet this was one glaring example of where they themselves didn't have the level of proficiency to coach. So my concern is very, very deep, and my concern is that this is like you, know, you deciding that you want to take up the cello, and you go out and you look for a teacher, and you find a teacher only to learn that the teacher has only played the cello for a week. And the, that teacher doesn't have the level of proficiency to be able to really help you a lot. In fact, that teacher could have bad habits that haven't been corrected themselves, and they could be actually passing those bad habits on to you. So I just, you know, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to do as an industry to solve this on a global scale, but I want to at least raise awareness to the problem and provide some short-term solutions to what you can do to develop what you need in terms of this baseline level of proficiency, because we do need to develop more improvement coaches. We definitely need to spread that improvement knowledge across organizations as quickly as possible, but I, I'm a little concerned that we may be doing this a little prematurely, so that's the, the uh, two triggers for me to do this webinar. In terms of the role of an improvement professional, now I'm talking about both full-time professionals and also people that are serving in a dual role. They may have direct reports and be overseeing a department and also be doing some sort of um, improvement leadership. So when you think about it, there are practitioners to me are the technicians. You know, they're the people that are actually doing. And you find, um, especially in the Six Sigma world, you find a lot of the various level belts, but especially when you get into the black belt, master black belt level, they really are, are residing primarily in the practitioner role where they are doing and the goal is results. Then there's what I call the facilitator role, and the facilitator is someone who's typically leading project teams or problem teams in getting results. It could be someone that's facilitating a value stream mapping activity, it could be someone who's facilitating a Kaizen event, or more commonly, someone who's facilitating you know, some sort of other gathering that improvement is the goal in that. And in that case, the primary role is to lead others, and the others are doing the doing. You know, so you're leading, teaching, coaching, a little bit of everything there. And in that case, the primary results, the primary focus is still on results. And then secondarily, you're developing people as you get those results. The third type of role is the coach. Now, coach is a funny word because coach, what we mean with improvement coaching, is very different from what we mean in terms of coaching, you know, executive level coaching, leadership coaching. So that type of coaching is much more on helping people, you know, bring out the best in themselves and learn how to be more effective in their roles in terms of the softer skills and that type of thing. What we're talking about is much more akin to a coach in the sports or the music world. These are coaches that are teaching people how to do things, and they're actually serving as a course corrector much of the time. So I'll talk a little more about that as we go on through the webinar. But it's a heavy teaching role, and in this case, ideally, the primary role is people development and passing on that knowledge to people, and then secondarily, it's in getting results. So you always want to get results, but there's just a slightly different emphasis on people development versus results in the coaching realm. And it's you know not unlike those of you who may be parents, it's not unlike being a parent 
and trying to develop a child, and I don't for a minute mean to put employees and children in the same bucket, but this is a, a great analogy for the you know, number of you that have had kids or have kids. You can either do for the child, and it'll get done better, quicker, all of that, or you can teach the child how to do it, and it will likely take longer. It may not be quite as high quality, but that's part of their development. So in that coaching role, organizations have to develop a sense of patience so that they're not expecting people to be developed and get results at exactly the same pace. There's just no way to get people developed and get results at the same pace. If you want fast, fast, fast results and you're you know, bleeding at the jugular and you've got a huge business need, you need to bring someone in to just do it and then you know, move back into the coaching role whenever you have a little more wiggle room and things aren't as dire. Now, the improvement facilitator role, the middle role there, I want to talk about that just for a little bit longer because this is another thing that I find a lot of folks are just missing kind of the full spectrum of roles that you play and therefore skills and knowledge that you need to possess. So when you're leading a mapping activity or a Kaizen event or any kind of group activity where the primary result or the primary goal is results but you're getting results through developing the people, you're serving as a teacher. A director. So the director, for example, will pull the team back in if they start going out of scope. So that's part of the, that director hat that a facilitator wears. A cheerleader. Hey, let's face it. Improvement is really hard sometimes. And people get tired. They get worn down. And they need someone to bring them back up and, and assure them that they're in the right path. They're doing well. And you know, it's a little rah-rah. It has to be a little rah-rah in order to get people to stick in with the journey, which is sometimes a really tough journey, sludging through mud at times. <laughs> the, um, the other thing, the coach is you know, really a coach that's making the play by play and, and, and calling in the calls. So, you know, some quarterbacks, many quarterbacks get to make their own plays. But there are a number of them that take orders from the coach because the coach is the one that really has a, a better sense of what's going on and has the big view and can see everything that's happening at once. So you are playing the role of a coach and you are sometimes calling in a play and calling a foul and all kinds of things like that during these facilitation times. The referee. So the referee comes in and a very similar to the, the judge, the mediator, when there is some sort of a disagreement and you have to help a team reach consensus. So you have to have psychological savvy to understand how to bring people together and that's something that with practice you can get very, very good at. A timekeeper. You know, a lot of times, especially if you're in a mapping or a rapid improvement situation, you've got to keep a really close eye on the clock and make sure that you're allowing the team the freedom to you know, form and storm and, and everything that they have to do to get results, but you also have to make sure they keep moving forward and you get done by the time that you're supposed to be done. And finally, there's a big part of the facilitator role that is helping break down the uh, the the tension or the, um, sometimes it's more than tension, sometimes it's overt anger between two different parts of the organization. And so you're, you're helping bridge those two parts of the organization together. And so again, heavy psychology on a lot of these fronts. So that facilitator role becomes very, very key to make sure that you have the full range of knowledge and skills in order to be better and better and better at facilitating. And you don't have to have perfect development before you start because you obviously learn a lot more when you're doing than you ever do when you're reading or you're in a classroom. But you know, just keep in mind that ultimately you want to get better and better at each of these roles. So I like to start with a you know reflection all the time you know that is based on know thyself and you know being self aware and being very very clear about what you can and can't do what you're good and what you're not really enjoying so much is the the key to success or a key to success. So one of the things I do when organizations are selecting internal people to be facilitators is we do a self-assessment to just make sure that someone knows what they're getting into and they have the personality, disposition, and aptitude to really move and be successful in that role. So I'm, I'm not going to read all of these, but I just want to point out a couple that um, I think are that trip people up a little bit and surprise people. So the thick skin. 
I see a fair number of facilitators out there, and I'm using the term facilitator to encompass the coach. And also, if someone just asked about sensei. Yes, it is a very vogue term these days. Um, sensei is, you know, the Japanese term for master. And so you know, there are certainly people that are senseis. I believe John Shook, for example, the CEO of LEI, is a sensei. But most senseis don't call themselves senseis because there's a fair amount of humility that's required in, in this work. And so, <coughs> excuse me, if you have someone calling themselves a sensei, you might want to just take another look at if they're the right person for you to be helping lead change. Um, but that's, you know, it is a vogue term. I, I, I don't feel comfortable using it for me. Um, I think some people will think I'm somewhat of a master at some of this, but hey, I'm still learning, and I, I just don't think that using that label is, you know, all that effective myself. Thank you for that question, Steve. Um, so back to this one, uh, the thick skin, you've got to have thick skin because people will attack. You know, people that feel threatened, you know, they'll attack, and there's just, you, know, you have to be really good at understanding their shoes that they're walking in and being able to, you know, be in their shoes and find out what the root cause is of their, of their concern and then counter it effectively. Another thing is math and calculations. You know, I see people choose to go into improvement that are pretty math phobic. And, you know, there's a lot of data that you need to get very comfortable with. And so people need to really understand and like math in order to be highly successful at making improvement especially if you're going to make improvement at a high level. Um, reflecting and mediating, both of those are, you know, kind of practices that are very, very uh, commonly used. Mediating is, you know, basically getting two people to get agreement or consensus and reflection on everything you've done in the course of a day. You need to be kind of a habitual reflector in order to be able to grow and grow and grow and be effective as a facilitator. And the list goes on. So you can you know, take a look at that list and you know, take a really good look at who you are and what your personality style is. And some of these can be developed, some of them cannot. Um, you know, you either like to investigate or you don't, number one. You know, people either, you know, have that scientist mind and, you know, cur naturally curious or they really don't possess that. So I would uh, take a good look at this list. Now, another thing I wanted to point out is something that I talk about in my book, The Outstanding Organization, on page 14, for those of you who like to have the page references. Um, there's an effect that's known as the Dunning-Kruger effect that is very interesting, and it's what we will sometimes refer to as a blind spot. So these researchers, Dunning and Kruger, found out that there's a cognitive bias that most people have, and they have this inability to properly assess their own level of skill. So it takes a third party assessing their level of skill in order to give them that kind of honest feedback for them to understand where they really are. And the problem with this dual Kruger effect, which again, most people possess some level of this, is that it leads to not only erroneous choices, so you can decide to do something or you can take some sort of action that is based in this, this kind of, um, this perceived proficiency that simply doesn't exist, and then on top of it all, the inability to recognize that that's what has just happened makes it a double whammy. So part of what I'm trying to do with organizations is help people understand what they are missing and, and then provide a means for them to develop that. So part of what I like to do is very much based on Covey, uh, the seven habits of highly effective people, habit two, begin with the end in mind. In order to take this path and get better and better and better at leading improvement, we need to start thinking about, well, what do we really want at the end of it? And that's going to be the rest of the webinar. Let's begin with the end in mind. What does good look like? Well, first we need to define what problem we're trying to solve. So, you know, this is a great way to practice PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Adjust, or PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Great way to study it and practice it is on yourself. What problem are you trying to solve? Now let's talk about what a problem is and what a problem is not. So when I use the term problem, and I went into this a little bit in the outstanding organization as well, I use the term problem very broadly. I don't discern between an improvement opportunity and a problem like many do, and I'm totally okay with people who do that. So the way to think about a problem to me is it's any gap 
between where you are and either where you want to be, that would be more of an improvement opportunity, or where you need to be, that's more of a dire problem. And so there's a little different sense of urgency when it's someplace that you need to be, which is why I like to use the word problem for both of those um, areas. So when you think about organizational need, there's typically a problem, a gap, between where the organization or department or work team is currently performing, some sort of metric, and where they need or want to be. And it could be that they're already performing at top levels, but they want to raise the bar and beat the competition. It could be they're already performing at great levels, but they want to squeeze you know, a little more efficiency into, or bring a little more efficiency into the department and squeeze out a little more time. And that can still be recognized in my vocabulary as a problem. So what I see is organizations have tons of problems to be solved, tons of problems to be solved. So we need to create an army of problem solvers in order to achieve that. So how do we get this army of problem solvers? Well, you know, we've got people, whether again you're a line manager, a vice president, a C-level, or a full-time improvement professional, there you, there you are going, ah, hello, I don't know what I need, I don't know what I need to develop. And here's you in the future state where you're rocking and rolling, you're a rock star with improvement, and we've got this gap in the middle which is our problem. And that is the gap about the proficiency level and the knowledge, the knowledge you possess and the skills that you possess. So the gap is where you are and where you want to be. Well, let's talk about the root causes for those gaps. I have two hypothesized root causes for what I'm calling the proficiency gap in the improvement world today. The first one, naivete. So I don't mean naivete in a negative sense, because I think sometimes people throw that word out, oh, you're so naive, and, they, and it's kind of a slam. I don't mean it that way. I mean it the way the word is actually meant to be used, which is just, it's, it's like ignorance. It's, it's just not knowing. It's just not being aware, it's, you know, it's not a, a, a negative thing, it's just, it is what it is. It's just not knowing that something is important or, or what you need to be doing. So I'm going to start out with a definition of lean because a lot of the naivete I see out there is actually around understanding what lean is. So it's no wonder that improvement professionals aren't developed in order to really achieve lean when we don't even know what lean is. How can we possibly develop skills if we don't know what we're supposed to be achieving? So lean, in my opinion, is, in, and in my experience, is a business management approach. I should have bolded that. Let me say that again. <laughs> lean is a business management approach. And it really is a business management approach that focuses on creating products, improving operations, and developing people, not necessarily in that order, to deliver, to deliver customer value and create prosperity while consuming the fewest possible resources. Okay, this is my definition of lean. Lean is a business management approach that focuses on creating products, improving operations, and developing people to deliver customer value and create prosperity for the organization while consuming the fewest possible resources. I'd like you to just reflect for a moment and do a little check on what you have been thinking that lean is. And, and just take a, a, a thoughtful moment here. And for those of you who are um, giving the questions about where is the slide, you're right, I snuck it in about two minutes before the webinar. So um, what we'll do is our materials are already always on SlideShare. So when we upload the materials to SlideShare, this will be the version you get. And you can always download it again from SlideShare. They'll be up there um, probably this evening, but at the latest tomorrow. So you can take a look at that. Same with the recording on the webinar. For those of you who are new, it's going to be on Vimeo, YouTube, SlideShare, and on my website as well, our website as well. So that's the definition of lean. So this may start shifting your thinking about what you need to know. I'd like to talk about some misunderstandings about lean because, again, the skill set and the knowledge that you need to have is very much dependent on what you think lean is and how your organization is using lean. So a common misunderstanding is that lean focuses on waste reduction and speed, and Six Sigma focuses on quality and variation reduction. Could not be further from the truth. Lean is very much 
focused on quality. The way that Lean gets around the quality question, though, is a little different, and that's what I think is so counterintuitive and gets people confused about, oh, Lean doesn't focus on quality. Well, of course it does. You know, what really what happens is time is the primary metric in Lean. So we hear a lot about lead time, and I always focus a lot on process time as well. So with lead time reduction, what the kind of counterintuitive or eastern way to go about the quality question is that by shrinking time, you surface all of the quality problems in a pretty profound way because there's absolutely no way to shrink your lead time if you have rework in the system, if you have the need for rework in the system. So it's this counterintuitive way to get to the quality question, and it, Lean is absolutely hugely focused on quality. I've just never understood this. The, you know, I re you read this all the time. It's like, what the? No. <laughs> That's not what this is. So what it is is Lean is very holistic, and it, quality is at the core of it. And um, th I think it's just that misperception about lead time and what lead time is really doing that makes people a little confused about that. So hopefully I've cleared that up for you all right now. Okay, another one. A lot of people say, oh, well, Lean is qualitative and Six, six Sigma is quantitative, data-driven. Well, not so fast. So Lean is very, very heavily based on fact-based decision-making, whether it's data or whatever, but fact-based decision-making, usually data. But what Lean asks us to do is use that same kind of thinking that you just saw in the definition of Lean, minimum necessary for maximum outcome. So that was the part that says consuming the fewest resources. What's behind that is minimum necessary for maximum outcomes. Min minimum necessary is only part of it. Maximum outcomes is what you're going for. So what Lean challenges us to do is get the minimum amount of information we need to make phenomenal decisions and draw absolutely accurate conclusions. What happens in most organizations or many organizations is they get tripped up in analysis and get into analysis paralysis and Lean challenges that in a big way. So you'll see a little more about this later in the webinar, but it's, it's a bias to action so that you can then you know, get, get improvement and then make iterative improvement cycles from there. And you're seeking perfection rather than waiting for perfection. That's, there's a big difference there. Another misunderstanding, well, Lean doesn't rely on statistical tools. Uh, tell that to Toyota. <laughs> of course it relies on statistical tools. However, the Lean programs, quote, unquote, don't often teach the same kinds of tools that you see in a Six Sigma program, quote, unquote. And the reason why is that Six Sigma is indeed biased very much toward the, what I call the big guns, the heavy lifting kinds of tools that you need when you've got very, very complex problems with very narrow bands of tolerance. And those kinds of, of improvement problems, they do require the big guns. <laughs> so, so Lean doesn't tend to um, include a lot of that in the regular training programs, but, they, but you know, it is data-based and statistics are part of what makes data-based. So whatever you need to solve the problem is what Lean relies on. It's very holistic. Next, Lean doesn't rely on precise measurement. Well, this kind of gets back to the first thing or the second one I, I talked about where what happens with Lean is accuracy, if it's going to give you the same decision and, and have the same action as an outcome as precise information, will honor accuracy. Because, again, minimum necessary for maximum outcomes. So there are a lot of decisions that can be made around improvement where precision isn't needed. However, if you're making a staffing decision, for example, you can't just you know, go out and ask, ask someone how long it takes them to do their work. You need to do a, a bit of a time study to find out how long it takes so that you're making an accurate staffing decision. But when it comes to deciding where the highest priorities are for improvement, knowing that it takes someone an hour to perform a task that seems like it should take 10 minutes is good enough. I don't have to go out and measure that. Uh, knowing it's taking an hour when it's a 10-minute task is, you know, an obvious place to put some action and make some improvement. Another one, Lean is a method for improving processes. I've actually recently been hearing this more and more. I, I was away, I, mean, I wasn't hearing it for a while, and now it's coming back. It's like, it's back. And it's, yeah, it is a method for improving processes, but it's really this overarching business management approach that happens to include process management and process improvement. So it's, it's if you 
choose to use lean just to improve your processes as an organization, that's okay, but just know that you're using about 10% of what lean actually does for organizations, and there's a whole, a whole lot that's being left out there. Similarly, lean as a tool is another misunderstanding. Depends on how you define tool, but again, you know, I, I think tool minimizes what it really is, and it probably reflects a misunderstanding of what lean is. It is, again, a business management approach. Finally, misunderstanding is that lean is events-based, so everything is about Kaizen events or mapping events and that type of thing. Could not be further from the truth. Lean organizations have first and foremost an extremely strong culture of daily improvement, which is not events. This is daily improvement that's being led and managed by frontline supervisors, managers on a daily basis. They also use traditional projects a lot. You know, in my clients, we're doing, you know, big projects much of the time using A3 management as the structure and the framework for that. And events, even though Mike and I, Mike Osterling and I wrote a book called the Kaizen Event Planner, obviously we, we like Kaizen events and we wrote a book on it, but I haven't led a Kaizen event. No, that's wrong. I've, I've led one Kaizen event in the past year and a half in my client base. So events, we wrote the book because we wanted people to have a great way to plan and execute a Kaizen event, but it doesn't mean that we're overly zealous about using events, and it certainly doesn't mean that you should only use events to make improvement. It should be very selected. So this slide that you're seeing now is a, or almost seeing, there you go, now you're seeing it. This slide is a summary of what you just saw. So I just put one slide together so that if you want to have conversations in your organization, you've got one summary slide, um, but it's a little too busy to <laughs> use that as our, our learning. So some of you already asked, why did you have an umbrella? <laughs> On your on your first slide, what's what's is it going to rain in San Diego? Um, no, it's not. But the umbrella comes from wanting to be a little more clear on the components of lean and looking at lean as this overarching business management system with component parts. So, what are those component parts? Well, if you take a look at the Toyota Triangle that you'll see a lot in literature, um, I happened to be introduced to it first in Mark Graben's Lean Hospitals, and it was a slightly different version of this, and then he referenced Gary Convis's article, The Role of Management in Lean Manufacturing Environment, and Gary didn't have a picture, but he described the Toyota Triangle, and he was the former COO, or CEO of TMMK in Kentucky, and that article is pretty, it's hyperlinked down here. It's a pretty old article because he was still CEO when he wrote it. But it's seriously one of the best articles I've read describing lean. And even for those of you who are not in manufacturing, it's a very concise look at what lean really is. I highly recommend that you download that and uh, take a look at it. You can either click on the PDF if you're looking at it on a screen, or you can uh, just Google the article. I have a similar triangle that I've been using for a while called, uh, and what I say is that lean consists of principles, practices, and tools. So you can either say that it's a philosophy at the foundation and then there's a set of technical tools and management practices. You know, that's fine. That's the Toyota way. Mine um, is similar instead of philosophy, principles, practices, and tools instead of technical. And notice that people is at the core of both of these triangles. So people is the core. People development is at the core. And we're going to be learning more about why that's so relevant as we go on here. So here's the umbrella, using the umbrella metaphor of this lean management system. And it's broken into three basic component parts, the principles, the practices, and the tools. So if you're going to be leading improvement and using lean at any level, in the organization, you have to be fairly savvy with all three of these components. What do we mean by principles? Well, there's a lot to it, and I'm not going to go into all of these because it's a, a short webinar, but you'll see that there's these philosophical foundations that is what makes Lean Lean and what is what makes Lean so powerful. 
It's a combination of kind of more technical things like how do you get flow and pull into a system and some, some more cultural things, how do you get continuous improvement in a system, and then also some kind of values and, and personality and psychological components like humility and respect for people. So there's a lot to it, and if you're going to be a stellar improvement professional in today's world, you need to get very clear on what each of those mean. Practices. These are things that you do over and over and over. Now, it may be infrequent, like once annually, or it may be very frequent, like daily. But in, these, in this case, it's, it's something you do over and over and over. So plan, do, study, adjust problem solving, getting people at every level of the organization. And I'm talking from the front lines to the CEO and possibly even to the board, if you have a board of directors or some sort of governing body, Getting very, very good at plan, do, study, adjust is essential for a lean organization. Strategy deployment is an annual cycle typically for that with periodic checks, sometimes monthly. I recommend monthly. And if you aren't familiar with that, there are books on it you can get to on my website under the Learn button. And then I also have webinars that have already been recorded on strategy deployment. And I may be doing one again in November. I'm not 100% sure yet. Uh, go and see Gemba management, uh, consensus building. I'm, I'm throwing in some of the Japanese terms because those of you that are out there going to conferences and, and possibly moving from employer to employer, you may walk into an area where they say, hey, you know, tell me about Nimawashi and your experience. And you may say, what? <laughs> and so you, you want to learn some of the words. Um, and then visual management is one of those things that's both a countermeasure and also a practice, a management practice to be done daily. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. <laughs> Drum roll please. There's a lot to know. Let me say that again. There's a lot to know and have proficiency in when it comes to the tools piece of it. Unfortunately, the lean movement got overly focused on tools and forgot about the, the practices in large part and forgot that leadership standard, leader standard work and leadership shifting is a big part of the improvement process and that leaders can't delegate improvement. They have to be actually involved in improvement at a, strategy, at a strategic level. Forgot to mention the cultural things. All of that was kind of un uncovered back in the very early days of lean in the, the late 90s. And so then when 2000 hit, we started getting more and more familiar with what was really happening at Toyota and what really comprises lean and what really makes for success. So this is not an exhaustive list. This is just, you know, some of the more common tools that I, I believe every single improvement professional needs to be pretty savvy with applying all of these. And if you don't have an opportunity to apply them, partner up with someone who is using them so that you can really learn them deeply. And there are workshops you can go to, etc. But there's a lot to learn. Did I say that again? There's a lot to learn. <laughs> all right. Now, let's talk about root cause analysis and, and actually the analysis tools in general. Here's where there's a bit of a, uh, I think, a confusion, Lean versus Six Sigma and everything. The Six Sigma programs do a very, very good job at getting into what I call the big guns. And the big guns are things like ANOVA, control charts, design of experiments, FMEA, hypothesis testing via F-tests and T-tests, scatter plus, regression analysis, and st standard deviation calculations. Don't freak if you don't know what these things are. <laughs> you don't need to know these, but you do need to know, let me back up, you don't need to be proficient in these, but you do need to know what they are used for to be able to recognize when a problem that you're working on could really benefit from this kind of analysis, and then you need to have a resource to turn to. So this is where when you have Six Sigma black belts or master black belts internally, green belts can maybe do some of this, but they're not usually exposed to it in a very deep level. If you've got some internally, that's where you go calling on your friend. I call it phone a friend. <laughs> you phone your favorite Six Sigma guy or gal and say, hey, I need help. Um, and that's, that's a great use of that resource. 
And so, you know, all organizations should have either someone internally that knows how to do this really well or have some sort of an external resource you can turn to. And there's, you know, a fair number of us have coaching services where we can do just ad hoc coaching when there's a tricky problem. So that's another option for you if you don't have these resources internally. All right, back to the root cause, my hypothesized root causes for the gap in the, the proficiency gap. So the second area is impatience. So what I find is that it, people in organizations and leaders in particular have very little understanding on what it takes to develop. Let me go back. Look at this list. Look at this list, and this is just the tools. This isn't becoming really, really good at PDSA and at uh, going to the Gemba, go, go and see. This, this isn't any of the practices, the management practices. This is just the technical tools, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is the basic tools that you need to understand to be highly effective and be able to pull out the types of things you need depending on what problem you're solving. And so... It, you know, think about becoming proficient at anything. Those of you that play an instrument, how long did it take you to get pretty darn good at it? Those of you who are sports folks, you know, golfers, um, any, you know, hockey, whatever you play, how long did it take to get pretty darn good? And for those of you that are golfers, you may say, I'm still not very good. And look, and how long have you been at it? So we have to be very, very careful to measure where we're at and be open and understand where we're at and understand how we need to develop to go forward. So impatience is not going to serve us well in this particular vein. So 10,000 hours has been you know, pretty much proven over and over and it's, there's some recent research that is sort of trying to debunk this 10,000 hour thing but it's not, they're not successfully debunking it. And if you listen to actors who finally get their break and musicians that finally get their break and sports um, people who finally, you know, make it into the professional ranks, almost all of them without exception say it's been a 10-year journey. The Blue Angel pilots have to be, they have to be pilots for 10 years before they can even apply to be a Blue Angel pilot. So 10 hours seems to be kind of sort, kind of sort of the, um, the, the norm. And what is good to be aware of, again, know thyself is that you can have general awareness about ideas and it doesn't mean you can actually do anything with it so you know for example let me think of something that I don't know how to do well let's go back to the this list here I have never done a design of experiments I know what it is I know when it needs to be used but I would call on someone on my team or if a, the client has someone internal I would call on them to actually do it I don't know how to do it so I'm aware of it but I'm not proficient in it, not even close. So, um, so I think, hang on, oops, am I going backwards? Wait, oh yes, there we go, sorry. There we go. So knowing where you're at in the spectrum is really important. The other thing that's important is to start thinking about how do you develop your, how do you learn? Classroom learning is very limiting on how much you can learn. You really have to do, so you can get better classroom learning that's simulation based and doing will help deepen the learning. It's still in the classroom. Doing in the real world is where it really starts deepening the, your understanding and experience. So project based programs beat non project based programs, but programs still, you know, real world experience beats programs hands down. Now, when it comes to coaching, Coaching, you don't have to wait till your master to start coaching, but you absolutely should not be down here, which is what I saw in the Lean, the Lean uh, Coaching Summit. You should not necessarily be all the way down here. You could be somewhere in the middle and then be really aware when you get into something where you don't know the answer for it that you're, you use that as a learning opportunity for yourself. So you can read more about this in the Outstanding Organization if you'd like to get more deeply into that development cycle. So what do we do about this conundrum that we're in, where we've got all of these needs and we don't have necessarily high levels of proficiency in the full range of, of skills that we need to be successful? Well, first of all, <laughs> this is my, my finger wagging, you must read. 
if you want to be a professional anything, whether it's a lawyer, accountant, an engineer, an improvement professional, you have to keep up with what's going on in the world around you. And in the research world, in Lean in particular, there's a big need to be reading more recent books. If you read Lean Thinking or The Toyota Way and that was it, then you have been left in the dust and you need to go back and you need to start reading some of the more, um, the more uh, recent books. I have a reading list on my website that's divided by category. Every book on that list I have read and that, every book on that list are books that I recommend. Uh, it's a big list, don't get me wrong, but you, know, you can pick and choose based on the category of what you feel you need based on your lovely self-assessment that you're going to be doing and your clear self-awareness. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that the reason why I say if you read Lean Thinking or the Toyota Way and that's it, you're behind the eight ball, is because, for example, Lean Thinking, the Bible of Lean, wonderful book, wonderful contribution, not going to take anything away from uh, Jim Womack, Dan Jones, and their teams. Phenomenal book. However, back then, we weren't as aware of all of the leadership and cultural pieces of the lean world. The other thing was, and this is a little bit of a shocker, was that Plan, Do, Check, Act, or Plan, Do, Study, Adjust, wasn't even mentioned or wasn't mentioned much. It was, there's one reference of it in the book. And so, you know, it was, it was, a book is only, you know, what, 250 pages, so you can't cover everything in a book anyway, but this was our early understanding of Toyota, and before we got deeper and deeper and deeper into understanding what really made Toyota tick. In Learning to See, the Bible of Value Stream Mapping, that book, as phenomenal as it was, and earth-shattering and groundbreaking and all of that, didn't really talk about the role in value stream mapping from a strategic perspective. So while Mike and John were aware of that because that, that the authors Mike Rother and John Shook were aware of it because they were watching that you know at Toyota, um, you know it, it's a, a tactical book and so it has the tools of you know how to actually create a map and there's very little kind of background about the the kind of the fringes around which you're mapping. So you know there, there's again every book has a limitation. The Toyota Way, the Toyota Way now it, to me this is the most comprehensive of a general lean book if you want to read one general lean book but it's very very dense. I mean it's, it's a very big book it has a lot of concepts in it but it's probably the most comprehensive book we have yet um, about what lean is but it doesn't address lean outside of manufacturing. So it's just a little frustrating. Oh, hang on a second. I see a message that the book list link is not working. Um, hey, Amanda, if you're on, could you text me? Is there a problem with the link I have here, ksmartin.com forward slash reading list? If you could let me know, please, that would be great. Maybe I, maybe I have the wrong link there. Lori will get right back with you. Thanks. Okay. So, the, so you know, the books, the more recent books have, you know, kind of filled in some of these gaps that the early books didn't address yet. So definitely get reading if you haven't. Also, you must be coached. You, there are very few highly proficient musicians that are self-taught. Uh, the reading link list link works for a bunch of people. Oh, okay, so everyone's saying the link is working fine. Thank you, thank you. So um, I don't know if it's, is it pronounced Giles? I'm not sure why it's not working for you, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so back to coaching. You must be coached. Uh, very few people are self-taught and highly proficient. So you need to have someone that is a, a you know, higher advanced person that's coaching you all the time. And coaching, again, isn't the kind of coaching where it's just the softer side of the work. It's teaching you how, for example, to choose which root cause analysis tool, how to make sure that your problem statement is indeed clear and that you have uncovered the full range of root causes, how to determine the right countermeasure. If someone doesn't even know a countermeasure exists, they're not likely going to know to, to draw on that and to make improvements. So there's all of that work that, that requires you to be coached. Now let's talk about the coaching from a corrective perspective. So I'm known as a pretty tough coach and I see a bunch of uh, coaches on the phone right now <laughs> or on the, on the webinar. Um, the, the thing that's going on with coaching is that we're getting confused 
and getting kind of mixed up the improvement coaching with the leadership coaching. Improvement coaching is, is course correcting. It's correcting mistakes and habits and things like that, but doing it, of course, in a, in a very positive and developmental way. But if you ever hear John Shook talk about his coaching experience at Toyota or Gary Convis, I mean, they're tough. These coaches are very, very tough in order for you to learn as effectively as you can. So you see here like the tennis, the tennis coach is actually changing the way this tennis player is gripping the racket. The golf instructor is changing the way the golfer's head is angled down. The guitar teacher is changing the way the student is grasping the strings. This is the kind of coaching that most improvement professionals have not had and desperately need. So this is something to think about, you know, how do you get that coaching into your environment. The other thing that I was thinking about, and I, I actually have been thinking about this for a while, is that we really don't have a decent apprenticeship program in the, yes, tough love <laughs> from one of my clients, tough love. Um, so we don't have apprenticeships in improvement, and we really do need an apprenticeship model like the skilled trades have, where they start out as an apprentice, and then they move to journeyman, and then they move to master. And they only move by having people that they're working with. So you see in all of these pictures, you have like the, you know, the head chef, the executive chef working with a sous chef or a student chef. You know, I'm not sure exactly who these are. Think about the medical profession. You're an intern when you're trying to be a physician. You're an intern, then a resident. And then sometimes you even go into uh, fellowships before you actually are a practicing physician. Same is true with a lot of the skilled trades. Same is true, by the way, in hairstyling. You know, you, there's very few people that come out of school and they go right on to the um, you know, into a chair and they're cutting hair. They're actually working with someone else. We don't really do that in improvement. And I, this is my call to action for the whole community to, you know, think about how do we create this apprenticeship model. I've been scratching my head and doing a lot of thinking about this lately. So what are some other learning options that you've got to turn to? Because some of you have limited budgets and you know, your organizations aren't necessarily going to spend a lot of time and money in bringing external help in, and, but you desperately need to be learning, right? So let's talk about programs for a moment. Um, those of you who saw the email that are on my subscription list saw that I sent an email about my concerns and, and where we're at in with certification and certificate programs. And I was very quick to say, hey, you know, don't get me wrong, we offer a certificate program. But we offer a certificate program with a lot of caveats associated with it that talk very clearly about what you get and don't get with any certificate program. So let's talk first about certificates versus certification. I really want to clear this up because there's a mess out there on these two things. When I did my master's degree in education and adult learning, uh, my thesis was to develop a certificate program that was university-based. It wasn't in lean. It was actually phlebotomy, for those of you who are in healthcare. It was the first university-based phlebotomy program in the country. And I did a fair amount of research on this notion of certificates, certification, registration, and licensure. And the research is very clear that certification is a much more rigorous process than a certificate program, but it is also a process that has a lot of responsibility. So this, what you'll see here are two different kinds of certificate programs. One is just, you know, giving a certificate of attendance or completion that's attendance based. Another one is assessment and demonstration based. So for example, what the pro, most of the time when we offer a certificate program, it's internal and it's both a project-based program and the client can choose to have an exam at the end of it. So it's a fairly robust certificate program. The reason why it's not a certification is that a certification is awarded by a standard setting organization. The Karen Martin Group is not a standard setting organization and will never be. Um, so cert certification is results in credentials behind your name. It's a standards that are set by a defensible industry-wide process with job analysis and role delineation and, and a very rigorous process of determining what the content needs to be and what you're testing for. And typically, and this is not the case in the Lean and Six Sigma world, typically certifications requ require ongoing learning, proof of ongoing learning through annual CEUs. 
And so, you know, some programs have that, but most don't. And so the problem is that, that you can learn it as a you know, certain period of time, but then the world moves on, there's additional learning, and the person's not learning that if they aren't required to have CEUs to keep it going. So the University of Michigan has the most comprehensive research on these two if you're interested in getting a little deeper into this. Um, but it's just important to understand what you're getting when you go to a program and what you're not getting. Do I think that people should have some sort of certification or a certificate? You know, I don't. I, I don't. I don't possess this. You know, um, I think that if you're good at what you do and you have proven results and you understand what lean really is, that that should be of value. What happens when you go out, though, for a job and people are asking for a certificate or certification? Well, then maybe that piece of paper is worth something. So it's, you know, it's... If we just have to make sure that we don't assume a level of proficiency just because someone has a certificate or a certification that simply isn't there, and that's the big danger. So I'm going to, I could talk forever about this, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that behind. The only, in my opinion, the only true lean certification that exists is the joint venture between SME, AME, the Shingo Institute, and ASQ. The certification has three levels, bronze, silver, and gold. It's open to individuals, companies, etc. cetera. Um, it has a test. It has for uh, silver and gold uh, required projects that are the part of the whole, the whole um, gamut. And it's a pretty decent certification, except that it doesn't meet every criteria for certification. And the other thing that I am concerned about, that I've been pretty vocal about, and I'll be vocal again here, is that it's fairly manufacturing oriented. And while lean principles apply everywhere, and while lean tools apply everywhere, I very much believe with my extensive work in the office service and knowledge work world, as those of you who are in it do, that there are some slight different application considerations in lean based on the environment. And so, you know, I wish that they would um, if anyone from any of those organizations is listening, I really wish that you would give this non-manufacturing world some consideration and add some um, elements to the certification to address that. So that is my opinion, that that is the only true lean certification, and even that certification, it doesn't meet all the criteria of an actual certification. I'd like to just quickly give you a bit of warning. I think you need to be very, very careful when you're out there looking for certificate programs. And by getting a true list of skills that are needed, you'll be in a better position as a consumer to know if you're getting what you need. And so this, I, you know, I, I just am pointing out that here is, you know, ASQ is a wonderful organization. I'm a member. I've spoken at many ASQ conferences. Love ASQ. However, I just want to point out that ASQ is very much the norm when it comes to the content you get in a blended Lean Six Sigma program. Most blended Lean Six Sigma programs, no matter what level they're at, green belt, black belt, whatever, are heavy, heavy, heavy Six Sigma and very, very light on Lean. So the only place that they actually cover Lean is when it's within the process design mode. There's very little emphasis on the cultural elements of Lean, daily Kaizen, problem solving through you know, empowering the workforce and total employee engagement. It's, it, there's very little of all of that that is key to success with Lean for an organization. So if you look at this list and you look, compare that to the list I showed you before of the essential skills, there's just not a whole lot of overlap here. There's a little bit, but not a lot. As long as you go in understanding that that's what you're getting, that's my goal for today is to make sure that you're aware of what you're getting. Here's another example. This is a very common um, firm that offers all kinds of Lean and Six Sigma programs. And if you look at the learning object objectives, you again see very little lean. There's some you know, 5S, waste reduction, process mapping, mistake proving, and value stream mapping, and that's it. There's a whole lot more to lean than that. Also, the way that most of the programs that are very heavy Six Sigma focused are, are um, structured is you can see evidence of it right here. Closed projects and handover control to process owners. 
in the lean world, we don't hand over control to process owners. We involve process owners from the beginning. We're developing people and helping them learn as we go. So yes, there are very many needs for projects, but the projects aren't done solely by experts. They're projects that people are heavily engaged in, especially whoever's going to serve as the process owner. So again, you know, be aware of what you need and be aware of what you're getting and what you're not getting so that you can supplement your learning in another way. Here's another one. Um, this came to me actually right before the webinar. Someone emailed this to me. This is an organization that says International Independent Board for Lean Certification. Sounds pretty legit, right? Well, if you go into the site, you will see not one person named, not one bit of information on who's behind this, and that is a huge red flag. You know, so if these folks are, you know, as as respected as they say they are, then you know, name who's behind this. Who who's delivering the training? Who's on the is there a board? Who's on the board? Who who said that their curriculum is good? So this is something again, make sure you know what you're what you're getting. What should you ask before you invest in a program if you decide that you really want to go down that certificate or certification path? I think there are about six key questions. What do you need to acquire? So let's begin with the end in mind. Is this program going to give you that? Is this the best way to get what you need? What are you going to be able to do as a result of that new knowledge that can't do now? Is the program validated by some sort of industry recognized experts that have a lot of, you know, a lot of clout, they've written books, they're books that are doing well, all of those things. And how are they going to assess whether you've learned what you need to learn? Those are key questions that I, I would recommend you think before you invest in a program. Quite a few of you asked that question when you registered for the webinar. So that's my advice that you, you know, ponder those questions. What else can you do? I do believe that everybody should be attending at least one workshop or conference a year if you want to keep growing. Some of the better ones, in my opinion, are the Lean Enterprise Institute workshops and annual conferences, AME's annual conference, which is coming up here in Jacksonville in November, and the Shingo uh, Institute, their, uh, their annual conferences and, and workshops. The other thing about Shingo is they do have a certification system or a I'm sorry, it's a Shingo Prize. It's a great path for an organization to take, and they have different levels of the prize as well. And it's similar to what the Baldrige model is, only I believe there's even more rigor to it than what the Baldrige program has. And if you want to be serious about lean, it's a great way for your organization to set its sights, maybe not now, but in the future, to apply for a Shingo Award. It's very, very, very rigorous. Don't do it before you're ready. <laughs> okay, another thing you can do, like what you're doing, attend webinars and online learning. So um, there's mine, and I, I don't have anything else listed for the end of the year because I'm not sure I can squeeze anything in. I have very heavy travel coming up. Um, but you'll see below the webinar archive, all of my webinars are there. They're also on, up here you'll see YouTube, Vimeo, SlideShare. All the webinars are there as well if you're members of or if you frequent any of those sites. Also, Gemba Academy is a, a, a kind of well known, robust, uh, respected uh, provider, online provider in the industry. So that's another place that you could go for some online learning. Read blogs. People undervalue blogs, but there are two blogs out there that are my go-tos all the time. One is Mark Graben's Lean Blog. He just writes really good content, and it's not just all about healthcare. Really good content about the application of lean. And Mark Rosenthal has the re the Lean Thinker. He doesn't blog very frequently, but his blogs are always incredibly profound and very very good information on lean. So I recommend that and my own as well, when I finally get around to blogging. <laughs> get on social media. You know, people undervalue Twitter. There's actually a very, very robust lean culture and lean uh, community on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, don't discount it. I, I went to it kicking and screaming, and I absolutely love it. It's my favorite social media platform, hands down, and uh, I learn a ton from being on Twitter. So. Maybe my next webinar will be a tutorial. 
so that those of you who are on it can get on it because it does take a while to learn how to you know be effective with it and then YouTube this is uh, I did a search for value stream mapping and you know just were tons and tons of videos that came up on YouTube so there's a lot of free resources out there that can help you now just quickie before we go into the Q&A we are working on uh, a comprehensive skills inventory I tried my best to get it done by the webinar but we're you know as with anything it's starting to get more and more comprehensive so it's taking a little while longer I don't know when we'll have it done to be honest because I'm trying to make it um, a little sexier than it is right now but if you don't subscribe please subscribe to my list and then you'll be the first to know whenever it's ready so that is my quick overview of you know what you need to know and what lean really is so that you can get better at knowing what you need to know and a little bit of idea about how you can uh, look at your current level of proficiency and develop some some uh, learning plans and development plans so that you can get better and better and get your organization better and better results or whoever you're working with so with that, let me go ahead and take it to the questions. We've got almost 15 minutes, which is really great. Let's see. Um, book list. Okay, we got through the book list. So please ask lots and lots of questions so we can have it very interactive. And don't forget there's that hand raising. You can raise your hand and ask a question verbally, which would be kind of fun. Okay, let me looking at all the questions here. A lot of them were about the link. Is the Gemba Academy program a certification? Ah, good question. I don't think so. I think it's a membership that is uh, usually a company membership, and then it gives you access to all of their webinars. And like I've done a couple of webinars and podcasts with them, and they'll make it free for a couple days, and then it goes into the paid subscription. So I think there's a way you can take a quick look at something without having to pay, but I'm I'm not 100% sure. Um, exactly how it works so go ahead and check it out and um, but they're good people really good people Kevin Meyer Ron Piera and I forget the third guy's name um, ah. well oh John Miller is behind it but I was thinking about their other guy here in the US so anyway it's a it's a very very solid organization okay very manufacturing and at times more academic than hands-on application can take a while to obtain as well. This must be the AME, SME, lean certification I think Keith you're talking about. Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Greg, I'm sorry, did I say something else? Hmm, because I, I do know it's a Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Maybe I misspoke. I'm sorry if I did. Um, let's see, I'm going through, okay, a bunch of you say you want a tutorial, that's hysterical. Well, maybe we will. I, you know what? We will. We'll do that in November. I think I have a week that is moving to January for a client, and so I will schedule that for the week of November 17th. Amanda, <laughs> let's schedule something for the week of November 17th, and we'll do a, a, a tutorial. Okay. Um... The organization I work for, this is a question from Ryan, the organization I work for is not a lean enterprise organization. However, I infuse lean into all my work. How and where can I find a coach? Ooh, good question. Uh, so you can, you can hire a coach. You know, there are, there are lots of people out there that you can hire. We, we do it. I have usually only two coaching clients at a time because I'm gone so much and it's hard to schedule. But I do have two coaching clients right now where, you know, they have a defined problem and we meet about once a week, once every other week for an hour. And, um, you know, it's part of that type of coaching where it's course correcting. If they, you know, aren't clear on the problem statement, for example, I help them get more clear on it. And if there's a stone they haven't overturned yet in terms of root cause analysis, I help them see that they haven't done that. If there's a root cause analysis tool, like, for example, you know, cause and effect diagram, uh, one of the clients had never done one of those. And so, you know, it was a bit, you know, teaching and showing her a couple of examples of one. So you can definitely find external coaches. Um, you know, you can either pay for it yourself or ideally your company will pay for that. And um, that's a good way to go. Uh, but it's, it's different from a mentor. So I just want to be clear on that, that this coaching is very kind of practical. It's about how to do work, uh, the improvement job better, for, and a specific problem is typically needed. So, 
Okay, top three things that a lean training program should cover. Top ten things, or the first three things. Um, okay, you guys, don't look at the slides, because I'm going to roll back and it'll make you dizzy if you look. Let me go back to the list. Hmm. I think uh, one thing is being very, very clear. Okay, you can look now. I think the first thing that they should cover is be clear on what lean is and be very upfront on what they're not going to cover in the class. So, for example, in one of my um, certificate programs, we have three levels, and one of them, there's absolutely no facilitation help whatsoever. They're really just learning how to be a technician and use the tactical tools. There's no leadership development. There's no cultural development. There's a little bit of discussion about daily Kaizen and total employee engagement, a little of that, but there's not a lot of that. And in the higher level one, there is a lot of that. So just being clear with people on what they eventually need to know is, I think, important. And a lot of programs are not clear up front. So that the buyer beware has to become, you know, how you figure that out. Uh, next thing with, I would say is probably what, the, what a value stream is, what value is, what a value stream is. I think that's really important. Like I, I had a very interesting call with a client a couple weeks back that they were working on a project or a problem and they had interviewed all of their own internal people on the root causes and the you know all the different elements of the problem but they had never really talked with their customer and so you know lean is very much a customer facing voice of the customer oriented approach and so that needs to be very clear in the program and then i think the next thing i'd jump to if i had top 3 would be metrics and how do you measure process performance before you even get into learning how to analyze and, and redesign. I think learning how to measure is important. I, 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 that was off the top of my head. I need to think a little bit more about that. Um, someone says here that Gemba Academy also has a black, black belt certification program. So thank you very much for that, Chrissy. Um, I missed most of the webinar. I got the time mixed up. When will this be posted to the website? We try to get them posted the same day. At the very latest, it would be within 24 hours. So do check back, Wes, and it'll be the feature webinar on the webinar page. Okay, next question. How could you leverage peer-to-peer -peer learning and a voluntary coaching network? Hmm, good question. So peer-to-peer -peer learning, what I like to do with clients is have people, at least two people that are the improvement people in training or you know even if they're full time work together so for example on value stream mapping typically i will uh, talk with the client about a tiered learning experience where the first go around the first value stream map two or more of the internal people are observing and they're kind of tethered to our hip throughout the whole development process planning and execution and then for the next value stream map one of those people co-facilitates with us with some, me or someone on my team and then the next one, the two of the internal people facilitate together, and we're just there as coaches. And I don't mean just in a small J way. I mean just in a big J way because we're, you know, meeting before the day and, you know, just making sure that everything is um, set up to have that team be as successful as possible. And then during breaks, we'll talk about, hey, did you notice that, you know, Joe has his arms crossed? I don't think he's buying into this. Did you see that? What do we do about that? You know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, of course correcting and discussion that goes on during the activity. And then we typically meet in the evenings as well to go through the day and reflect and course correct and do deeper learning that way as well. So that's one thing. The voluntary coaching network, I think you have to be very careful. I don't know who the volunteers are, but the people that are coaching have to have high levels of proficiency in doing improvement and be familiar and experienced with the full range of principles, practices, and tools before they should ever be coaching anyone. This is, again, like getting the piano teacher that, you know, really has struggles with complicated scales. Um, it's If you've got someone coaching before they're ready, they're going to not help the people they're coaching, and they could absolutely damage. I see it happening all the time. So that I don't know if that's what you were asking, but I, I, hope, I hope that was it, Crystal. Um, Okay, uh, Jeff Liker, Lean Leadership dot Guru. I I'm not sure if that was. Um, 
I, I'm not sure what that reference is. That must be a, a research. I, I don't know. Um, okay, next one. Don't forget. Oh, I would not forget the French people in Quebec. <laughs> Bonjour or bonsoir. <laughs> um, May 2015, there's a really nice healthcare, lean healthcare event in this city. Okay, well, now you all know in healthcare, it's time to go to Quebec in May of 2015. I'll be in tow. Okay, how does the performance excellence Baldrige criteria fit into what we need to know? Ah, good question, Michelle. Well, so I actually, between Shingo and Baldrige, I'm much more on the side of Shingo because I believe that it's a much more robust and rigorous process to go through. And it's very, very, um, you know, the board at Shingo is, is very, very current and, um, and they're exper really experienced. So Baldrige to me is, you know, a little bit older school. It's very valuable. Don't get me wrong. Baldrige versus nothing, I'd say Baldrige. But Baldrige versus Shingo, I'd say Shingo. So you could compare the criteria side by side, and you'll see the differences. I, I, I recommend you do that. Um, let's see. Tomorrow is Manufacturing Day. I did not know that. Happy manufacturing to those of you. It's Manufacturing Day. All right, next question. How do you think Lean Community could leverage peer-to-peer -peer learning and coaching as a voluntary basis, something like ACHE? Oh, I see the question. Okay. Yeah, you know what? That's a really interesting idea. I think someone would need to coordinate that. Um, so, hey, Crystal, I'm nominating you. Um, I think that's a really great idea is the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Again, you need to be careful. Make sure that the peers that you're learning from are, are fully knowledgeable and that type of thing. But, um, you know, voluntary coaching would be a great way. You know, maybe that's something LEI, Lean Enterprise Institute, could start. So I nominate you to lead this up. <laughs> okay, next question. Local lean networks are also good resources for coaching and support. I agree. Um, we have a couple, like there's one in Southern California called the SoCal Lean Network that Jerry Wright heads up, and it's a, a little bit of a side arm of AME, but it's not fully affiliated with AME, I don't think, but it's a, it's a very good local lean network. And I, I know Northern California has one as well, and I, I would assume most states do. There's the Iowa Lean, um, uh, Iowa Lean, uh, it's not coalition, but there's something like that. So, yeah, definitely check around uh, and see what's around there, around your area. Next question, and I'll go um, just two more minutes here. For the Lean Six Sigma, what can you tell me about the universities that offer certifications? I'm thinking about Villanova. I, I can't speak to any program. I would have to look at it in depth and see uh, what what it looks like. And I would also need to, you know, talk to people who've gone to, through that program. I would recommend that you ask them for references and that type of thing. There is not one university program that I think is as comprehensive as it needs to be. I, I will say that including the top ones. Uh, many orgs are developing or importing lean certification training and deploying graduates as their internal PI consultants. These organizations typically hire lean certified individuals to something, their internal PI teams. What upsides and downsides do you see to that approach? Which element? Are you talking about requiring that everyone be lean certified that they hire? If that's the case, I think it's a bunch of bunk. Um, there's a ton of really, really skilled people out there that, that, can, that can improve circles around people who are certified. Um, if that's, I, it, maybe that's not your question, Steve, if you want to clarify. Okay, next question. Timing is perfect. I need to work on my 2015 PPR. Yay. Very good. Very, you go, Stefano. Nice to see you again on the webinar, Stefano. It's been a while. Um, I like the apprenticeship approach mentioned. How do you approach or persuade leaders that apprenticeships for business improvement practitioners are valuable when many times these are borrowed or temporary resources? Yeah, good question, Keith. So one of my missions has been of late to go to sea level and help them understand the level of development that's needed because there's just this, uh, there's just this weird belief that how hard can improvement be? <laughs> and I say hard. <laughs> it needs to be someone who's very, very skilled. And I see people moving people from 
positions where they have staff and they're being ineffective as leaders into these full-time improvement roles I'm like no 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 that's the absolute wrong person to put into an improvement role so I think I don't know I think there has to be conversations with leaders on what is really required and hopefully this you could take this material from the webinar and show them the list of skills that need to be developed and hopefully that would help you get you some support and development Next question, and this is going to be the last question, is the facilitator evaluation shown on the slide in the beginning complete or is there more to it? Is it available on the resource page on your website? You know what? I actually don't think that one is. I will have Amanda go ahead and load that so that you guys that are, that are subscribers can get it. And those of you who aren't subscribers, you can go ahead and subscribe and then we'll give you the link when you when we're accepting you, you'll get the link um, to get to that shared resource listing. So uh, we'll go ahead and load that today, Laura. Uh, oh my gosh, there's more questions. Oh, there's so many more. Let me let me just do one more. Um, my organization's top managers are asking about transferability of lean projects, outputs, and learnings to other parts of the organization to avoid duplication of lean efforts. Please comment. Ooh, so here's something. I don't. How large is your organization, Elizabeth? If you could tell me how many people and how many offices. Because I'd like to talk a little bit about Grand Rounds. Grand Rounds is something that healthcare does, does <coughs> excuse me, especially in teaching hospitals, where they do a case study and they take a patient from you know the time that they are um, enter the system all the way through till they exit the system and it's great for physicians and other providers uh, ancillary providers too to learn about you know either tricky cases or unique cases and part of what I like to do with clients is have grand rounds for improvement where, for example, if you do an A3 cycle of plan, do, study, adjust, then at the end of it, you, you know, invite people, a brown bag lunch or whatever, and you go through it and you talk about lessons learned and you show the various uh, things that you, you know, the various steps you took. It's a great way for people to say, hey, we can use that over here. The other thing is, is that the last step in A3 is take taking a look at the work that's been done to see where it could apply in the organization. So if you're using A3 and you're using it kind of the pure way, it, there is a step where you're, you're actually looking for that. All right, last question. Uh, since lean is more than just tools and culture is impor important for improvement, what training tools are necessary to facilitate the change of culture or the openness to change in the culture? Uh, so I think that question really points to this need for leadership to understand that there's leader standard work and there are mindsets and behaviors that are very very vital that are leadership mindsets and leadership behaviors and I see a lot of leaders trying to delegate improvement down the organization and think that they don't have a role to play when in fact they have probably the most important role to play in all of it so it's there's a whole body of leadership leader standard work that has to happen in order to facilitate that cultural shift um, and it's it's you know it's big but it's usually the type of work that leaders really appreciate going through it's you know, transforming how they lead in a profound way thank you so much everyone this was really a wonderful group and uh, I was so glad to see people from all across the globe and for coming early and staying late and having breakfast while you're listening and all of those good things I do hope that you will uh, you know, keep, keep tabs, I'm going to go back to the last slide here, keep tabs on what we're up to and back to this, there we go. I thank you very much. Have a great day, a great evening, uh, wherever you are, and we'll see you another time. Thanks. Bye-bye.